Yeah. And, and you can see. Oh, and Kathleen's here, too. Oh, and Lori. All right, everybody, welcome. Hello, thank you for joining us. Welcome to the Chandler Center for the Arts. My name is Michelle McLennan, and I'm the manager of arts and culture for the city of Chandler, and very honored to host this uh, panel discussion. I want to take a moment as we begin uh, the discussion to acknowledge um, some people who are here. Uh, first, our mayor, uh, Kevin Harkey. And then I'd also like to acknowledge members or former members of Arts Commission. So we have members of the Chandler Arts Commission, the Chandler Cultural Foundation, the Chandler Museum Foundation, and the State Arts Commission. So if you are a member, would you please rise so we can acknowledge you for your work. Thank you so much. Uh, and now I get the uh, pleasure of introducing our esteemed panel. Uh, we have with us, uh, starting in no particular order, but Randy Cohen, Vice President of Research for Americans for the Arts. Uh, Randy has been empowering arts advocates since 1991. Uh, he publishes Americans Speak Out About the Arts, a national public opinion study about the arts, arts and economic prosperity, and creative industries, a mapping study of the nation's 675,000 arts businesses and their employees. He led the development uh, of the National Arts Policy Roundtable, an annual convening of leaders who focus on the advancement of American culture, launched in partnership with Robert Redford and the Sundance Institute. He has given speeches in all 50 states, and we are very honored to have him in Chandler, Arizona for today's discussion. All right. <laughs> Uh, next is Anne LeCure, Executive Director of the Arizona Commission on the Arts, whose mission is to create opportunities for all Arizonans to participate in and experience the arts. Anne is a policy strategist, facilitator, and seasoned executive who stays closely connected to an international work network of creative leaders and artists. She is an expert in, creating, in creative placemaking and placekeeping, creative industries, and cultural tourism, and the integration of the arts towards educational, social, and environmental goals in communities. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> Mitch Menchaca, Executive Director, City of Phoenix, Office of Arts and Culture, an Arizona native. He relocated uh, to from Phoenix, uh, from Washington, D.C., uh, to lead the Local Arts Advancement Department at Americans for the Arts, where he guided a team of professionals serving and advancing 5,000 local arts agencies. He is currently on the board of directors of the Herberger Theater Center and Webb Center for the Performing Arts, and is the governor-appointed arts and culture chair for the Arizona-Mexico Commission. Under his leadership, he oversaw Phoenix's participation in the Arts and Economic Prosperity Study 5. Was it 5? Okay, great. Thank you, Mitch. <laughs> and Sandra Bassett, president of Bassett Consulting LLC, and as of this week, the new CEO of the Phoenix Center for the Arts. Sandra is a visionary and entrepreneurial, um, entrepreneurial president and CEO. She has a proven record of successful leadership experience and collaborative team building. She's a dynamic motivational speaker, an international vocalist. If you haven't heard her sing, you should go. It's, she's real good. Um, under her leadership, she oversaw the West Valley's participation in arts and economic prosperity study. Welcome our panelists. So I'm going to start things off with Randy, uh, and I, I'm going to start with the first question, which is, um, tell us about the purpose of the Arts and Economic Prosperity 6 and how it will be beneficial uh, to the city of Chandler and other partners who are here. Great, thanks. Well, boy, such an ambitious crew to come out here in the middle of a beautiful afternoon and talk about economic impact of the arts. So uh, um, thanks so much. It's great to be with you. It's great to be out of the D.C. area. This is my first work trip involving an airplane in 25 months. Wow. So, and 
the first time I've had to wear socks anywhere. So, uh, you know, but I've got them on, so uh, uh, I'm ready to go here. So thank you. Um, uh, and such an esteem. So Anne and I work together. Mitch and I work together. Sandra and I have known each other, and we've worked together on projects, as with Michelle, for years. And so such incredible leadership in, in the area here in the region. So you're all... You're all very fortunate for that. Um, so uh, arts and economic prosperity, economic impact of the arts, you know, what? We, we love the arts because they inspire us and, and they engage us and they create, you know, these communities that we want to live in and work in. Um, but the fact is, they're also an industry. Arts employ people uh, locally. They purchase goods and services from other businesses in the community. Uh, they drive tourism. Arts organizations are good business citizens. And we're going to do this and talk about this economic impact study because it changes the conversation about the arts from one of a charity, subsidy, more gruel, please, kind of industry, you know, uh, entity to an industry an industry that really helps drive the economy. Um, and so, uh, I, I don't know, how many people like took up over the uh, pandemic like some kind of craft or, you know, tried something new, wire work, you know, or sewing or knitting? So I took up knitting. I always wanted to learn how to knit. Now I can, you know, I'm like a one-way knitter, though. It's like a scarf this wide and about a mile long. You know, there's giraffes standing outside my door because, like, it's the only guy that'll make one that wraps my whole neck. But, and then I sort of undo it and start it again, and I'll, I'll get better at it. But it got me interested, actually. There's a textile museum in D.C., and, and so my wife and I were like, well, let's start to get out a little bit, maybe, and, and, and see what's out there. And the museums are opening up and everything. And so we went online, and we found the museum, and it's ours, and, you know, got our tickets and everything, and did it virtually with a credit card. And, um, and you know, we made an afternoon of it. So uh, how many far farmers remember that yes, restaurant in Pennsylvania? Yeah. So we had a really nice lunch because, like, Oh my God, we're out, we're out, you know. And uh, I paid for parking when we were downtown, um, and I uh, had a nice visit at the museum. We went out for drinks afterwards, and so it was really a, a lovely time. Um, you know, we got there, and you know, there's the, you know, we got the, uh, there was an, you know, ex exhibitions going on, and they hand us the program and everything, and um, that's the kind of thing that happens thousands and thousands of times a day right here in Chandler, right here, you know, in, in the area, in the state, all, everywhere you go. When, you know, um, dinner and a show go hand in hand. You've heard that before, right? Well, so think about the impact of all that on the economy. You know, it started, um, well, when we were at home and we went online and, you know, we found the, uh, we found the website for the museum. So, Museums, right? You think of curators and people, you know, hanging art. Well, you know what? You got to have computer programmers, uh, obviously, doing that kind of work. And we bought with our credit cards. So now you got the e-commerce folks and the banking people getting a little bit of the action there. And went downtown and paid for parking, uh, you know, and so that, you know, there's always that and a really nice meal. And that's one of those um, uh, farm-to-table uh, uh, places and uh, so you know most of everything's grown within 50 miles of that restaurant and so the growers and the producers of the food in that local area are getting a little bit of bang for the buck because Randy and Ginny finally got out of the darn house <laughs> to see an arts event you know and we spent it's not cheap <laughs> I'm sure it was like a $75 lunch um, and then uh, you know we we went and you know even here, you go, you go to an afternoon thing about economic impact of the arts, and they're handing you out paper. Everywhere you go in the arts, you're always getting paper, right? You know, you're getting a program, a flyer. It comes in the mail. There's a writer for that. There's a graphic artist designer for that. The printers. Printers make such bank on the arts, you know? And, uh, uh, and so and the, it's got to be delivered. So every time there's an arts experience, and then mind you, the, the arts event hasn't even started yet, you know? Every time there's an arts experience, all kinds of industries in the community are touched. And that's the kind of thing we set out to, to learn about with this arts and economic prosperity study. And um, I thought I'd just do just a couple quick slides so uh, people kind of know what I'm talking about a little bit. And I know we're in East Valley, but um, 
Sandra uh, uh, led us through the West Valley region. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is a study we published in 2017. And uh, Arts and Economic Prosperity is the largest, most comprehensive study of its kind uh, anywhere in the country. So the new study that we're about to start, uh, you know, with Michelle and Phoenix and everybody right here, and um, is uh, Arts and Economic Prosperity 6. We've got 360 communities in all 50 states, communities as small as 1,500 people, as large as 4 million. You know what the takeaway here is? Even if anywhere where the arts are happening, there's going to be a measurable economic impact. And we'll talk about, uh, you know, why that's important here in a minute. But um, Part of this study we always start out with is reminding people, oh yeah, we love the arts, you know, and uh, no surprise, this is one of the largest public opinion surveys uh, done. Uh, that's what we do at Americans for the Arts. It's got to be big. 90% um, of the American public says, oh yeah, the arts improve our quality of life. No surprise there. 86% of the population, however, agrees that, yeah, arts good for local businesses, good for the local economy, right? Everyone starts playing back that little narrative like, yeah, last time I went to an arts event, we did retail shopping, I travel for arts and culture maybe, spend a night. When I choose the communities I wanna visit, I think about what am I gonna do while I'm there, you know? And so much of the time, it's like the culture, right? I'm looking for an authentic cultural experience. And so people get that. So what do we find out again? Um, West Valley, the first thing we do is we survey the uh, nonprofit arts and culture organizations in the community. And this is from the study, you know, half dozen years ago. So I'm um, sure most of these numbers, even post pandemic, will probably be a little bigger. But $30 million industry, right? Arts are an industry. And you can see um, 13 of that is spending by the organizations, and 17 of that is that event related spending by arts. Um, audiences. And so again, think of those organizations, uh, you know, the money they pay for people, they employ people locally, they purchase goods and services. Arts organizations are good business citizens. Arts organizations are members of the Chamber of Commerce. They work with, with tourism and economic development. So it's a way to change the conversation about the arts. Now, the value added aspect, however, is Randy's date afternoon at the Textile Museum, you know? And nationally, we did 212,000 audience surveys across the country, and we did about 1,500 of them just uh, uh, in the West Valley study. The typical attendee to an arts event spends $16.60 per person per event, not including the cost of admission. Right, and so you can see how that breaks down. And you know, just think about the last time you went to an arts event. You know, sometimes it's a, maybe an open air festival, maybe you just walk through and spend nothing. Other times, you know, you come here to this beautiful arts center, maybe you spend more. Um, and it's about, the proportions are, are about the same as you see everywhere, and some people, communities more, some less. You know, half on food, and then, you know, souvenirs, and uh, some ground transportation, that's my parking there, and uh, um, no lodging, but uh, uh, other is, is always interesting. So I was speaking to our colleagues up in Wisconsin, um, where one of the audience surveys, uh, there was a farmer who spent $60 uh, to pay somebody to milk his cows so he could go to the theater that night. <laughs> Isn't that great? People are doing what it takes to get to the arts, you know, and that's what this says. Now, in addition to how much did you spend when we asked all these folks, and you know what, next year, you're probably going to come here and someone's going to hand you a survey. So by all means, please participate in this because this is, this is what we'll be reporting out, you know, uh, later. Um, 15% of attendees come from outside the region and they spend uh, about $24 per person per event. So about half more. And when asked, why are you here? We're glad you're here, thanks for coming. Are you here on business? Did you come out of town to see you know, friends and family? About 85% said, oh no, we traveled here to attend this arts event. So you can really see the pulling power that the arts have, right? And um, so what's the economic impact of that? Jobs. You know, we got the mayor here, um, you know, and, and uh, so many great leaders. Uh, thanks for coming out today. Yes. Um, ask any, uh, here's, you know, we've all spent years in Washington, D.C. Ask any legislator what their three priorities are, and they'll tell you. Jobs, jobs, and jobs. Looking to support jobs, create jobs, keep jobs, grow jobs. Well, um, arts and culture industry, nonprofit, 758 jobs. You know, bottom line, arts, more than food for the soul, 
but putting food on the table for 758 households right here in the community. And remember, those aren't just at the arts organizations. That's some of the people at the restaurant. That's the printer. And these economic models that we'll customize for every community that we study will be localized. Uh, and these will be very local results. Government revenue. Um, you know what? Government's investing in the arts. They also need, <laughs> they need some revenue to help pay for all those vital services. Uh, $2.6 million. About one and a half of that going to the state. About 1.1 of that uh, going to uh, the local, local government. Nationally, total government investment in the arts. This is, you know, uh, five years ago. About $5 billion. Total uh, return, $27.5 billion. Small investment, big returns. That's the arts. Um, let me just, uh, this is, there's a lot of text here, but let me tell you how this is, uh, study is going to be really different. Pretty uh, hard to mm. see, but um, we'll make all this available. Plus, you know what? A lot of this, pretty much everything I'm talking about is on that handout as well, so uh, that's good. Um, we have found in the, our past studies, and we acknowledge that we have, our, our research is underrepresented um, organizations of color, uh, BIPOC organizations, black, indigenous people of color. Um, and so we have set out to center equity in this particular research study. And so, um, it's been a complete transformation of the study. I've hired an uh, equity consultant. We've got a new director on staff who's helping us do this work. I've got a, you know, AEP6 equity task force, uh, which includes local research partners, arts organizations that will be surveying, you know, um, other arts leaders just to help us uh, to do this right. And it's been a change in methodology to scrape out bias in the research and the survey and the analysis. It's going to um, change the process so uh, organizations that haven't been included or felt welcome before um, will feel hopefully different now and are more likely to be uh, part of the study. And it's going to change, you know, and affect the narrative on the other end. So uh, a lot more detail um, here, but uh, we're absolutely committed uh, to this. So um, economics, it's, it's, a, it's a different way to talk about the arts. Uh, and um, I'll stop there, I'll just sort of set the uh, Thank set the you table very much. That. Thank you. That was a good setting of the table. We appreciate it. All right, so we're going to move on with questions for the panel. Um, and no, feel free to step in whenever you feel like it. There's no rules here. Um, can you tell us why your organization decided to participate uh, in previous studies? Well, um, on behalf of the West Valley Arts Council at the time, they participated simply because there was a need to identify the organizations in the West Valley. Too typically, people in the state of Arizona have believed that arts and culture only existed within Phoenix and the East Valley. And we wanted them to know that, yes, there is activity in the 13 cities and municipalities that make up the West Valley. And then to be able to identify what they were, the economic impact and benefit to the community that arts and culture um, brought to the area. So West Valley at the time decided to participate to really identify those opportunities for economic enhancement for quality of in life engagement and then also to identify those organizations that were definitely supporting and in turn would be able to go back and ask for additional support so it was needed to say that arts and culture is live and well in the West Valley and this is what it looks like and that's why they chose to participate at that time Thank you, Sandra. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Phoenix has participated since the beginning, and when the recession hit in 08, um, there was a need to make sure that we were in AEP4 and AEP5 because the Office of Arts and Culture's budget was decimated. Um, a lot of arts um, uh, organizations in Phoenix were supported by the city, meaning they were city-run, and when the recession hit, they put those up to RFP to say, will still own the building, but please, someone, come run the programs and take it over. And we've been successful now that all those years later, including the Phoenix Center for the Arts is one of them, 
And we needed that data to say, if this ever happens again, we need to show that the arts is an industry, as Randy put out. It's not just a, a hobbyist sector or a, a, a nice luxury sector. It is a true sector that brings jobs, that brings economic impact, that brings um, joy and as well as quality of life. And because of the AEP5 information, I do have to say that I came in at the tail end of AEP5 my predecessor did all the work and I got to reap all the benefits of it. Um, <laughs> but that benefit was the pandemic. Yes. And when it came time to like, oh my gosh, um, what do we do? What's gonna happen with the budget? Of course, arts and culture was looked at as a way if we had to do a, a trial budget that zeroed out things, what would be zeroed out? But because I had this data, I could say, whoa, 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 we are um, needed in this community. The arts, while we can't go to events, is for healing in the community. Look at what we were before the pandemic. And because of that, we were able to make the case for CARES Act funding and the American Rescue Plan funding from our city council. And instead of being cut, we received over the past two years an additional $10 million mm -hmm. to give out to artists and arts organizations as well as small um, for-profit businesses. Mm -hmm. And now the arts are thought about differently, but I am getting the question from new city council members are, well, that AEP5 was great, what's gonna happen next? Right. So as soon as I found money in the couch cushions, I said, Randy, <laughs> I wanna pay for my next study and let's just call it a day. <laughs> Thank you, Mitch. Um, well, hey, I have the honor of announcing tonight that Arizona State is going to participate in yeah. AEP 6. And um, we are doing so specifically because of the leadership of our city partners who almost to a one, all of our Arizona cities are participating which creates a remarkable opportunity as a state agency to invest deeply in the um, equity mission and to make sure in particular that rural and tribal economies um, are well represented in the study. And I would wish if all of us went home with one word tonight, it would be ecosystem because that's really the right way to understand the way that our individual artists and our very small organizations or uh, independent studios, then our big halls, performance halls and galleries, um, think of all of the outdoors that you experience creative life in. All of that is best understood as an ecosystem that relates to each other. So this is a remarkable opportunity. Thank you, Michelle, for your leadership, um, for all of us to get in there together and through data represent that very uh, complicated, interconnected system that provides uh, opportunity for creative life throughout the state. <clears throat> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you know, you. one of the things um, uh, you reminded me that I didn't mention is um, part of our uh, project team is a, uh, an organization called uh, Hope Nation. It's a women-owned Native American organization, uh, and it's specifically to help. And so that's why I'm very excited about the statewide uh, partnership as well, because that's another um, sector of, of the arts world that... Um, hasn't been fully represented, uh, and we know there's a lot that goes into that. It's more than just numbers. There's a whole cultural uh, language, everything else. And so um, uh, we've brought in some really smart, amazing people to, to help us through that. Wonderful. And I did want to take a moment just to acknowledge, if you're from another city who is participating in the study, would you raise your hand? I know I saw City of Mesa. We have Cindy Ornstein. Um, and I saw Maja, Tempe. Maja, City of Tempe. Any other cities? City of Tempe, wonderful, excellent, thank you. I just wanna make sure we acknowledge you and thank you for being a part of, of today. All right, so we're, uh, another question. Um, what learnings came out of your participation in the AEP5 study, study or previous study? And do you have any advice for Chandler? So I think one of the big things, and 
I've been fortunate when I, in my career, I worked at the State Arts Commission, where we used to, in our general operating support, fund people to get into the study. Then I worked at Americans for the Arts and saw the research side of the study, and then came to Phoenix, and now I'm on the, other, the uh, city side of it. But the one thing is, it does take a lot of work to get that survey data, and I think one of the things is working with your partners. I see Chico here, who has participated in the past, and saying it's not as daunting as it is to ask your audiences or your attendees mm -hmm. to fill out the survey. But one of the things that I'm doing internally is spreading the wealth around. I think my predecessor had one person that worked with all 90 of our arts nonprofits across the city, and it was that person's only job and trying to spread that wealth. But your report is only as good as the data, so trying to get that data and trying to offer carrots to be able to get that. In Phoenix, um, you know, we are a $400 million arts and economic prosperity city, but that wouldn't have been possible without that data collection. So I think trying to figure out what the best way is for those organizations to not feel burdened or for their audiences to not feel burdened. I think it's going to take um, different tactics of getting that information from paper surveys to electronic surveys to focus groups. So it's really just about how you get that data without um, burning out the organizations. Great, yes. thank you. Very much so. Um, West Valley Arts Council, small organization, 13 municipalities and cities to serve, took on the task individually. The results were um, about 23.8% participation, so there was a large gap and opportunity of collecting data. Um, and going forward, it's gonna take more than just one organization, especially as a small nonprofit. It truly becomes a um, partnership with different cities, um, different nonprofits. That small nonprofit has to look at their base of people and the people around them. Can we get volunteers to help solicit the information? What are we doing from a marketing perspective? How can we leverage those larger organizations and the cities in the area because they need this data as well um, because as Mitch and everyone has said here, the financial opportunities and impact is great. The nonprofits need to understand that this data, again, can be used to help them as they're looking to ask for additional funding to do assessments to say that I may be here right now, but with additional funding, and because this arts economic impact study has shown that our particular area is expected to grow 20% in the next five years, we are asking for additional money, and we can back those numbers and also you know, quantify what it is we're looking for. So it's not just an individual um, event. It is something that truly um, has to be multi-layered, multi-engaged from the community, from the cities, and also to gather information from the smallest organizations to the largest, because you will find a lot of times many of the smaller organizations are typically run by people of color, and they have not had the opportunity previously to be at the seat at the table to say, here we are, and here's why we also need to have funding. So I'm very pleased with the direction the organization is taking this year. And additionally, Michelle, thank you for allowing smaller nonprofits to have a voice in this conversation today as well. Thank you. We're gonna use it to drive a much larger planning process that we're calling cultural equity planning. And that the core idea there is that uh, creativity is a birthright and we all have creative resources in every community. And so uh, we'll be conducting a statewide process to really shine the light on uh, those activities in communities and ask the question, how can our state and city resources lift up that work? And so um, our strategy is to embed the data, the, the quantitative data side of things in a very rich qualitative environment so that we can listen and learn about what community priorities are around creativity and then respond with really rich data environments that help tell that story in economic terms but then also in terms of like empathy you know mm -hmm. uh, arts are a place where we get to know each other by first name and that is a value that i know we hold really deeply in arizona communities so 
Uh, we're going to try to do a both and strategy there. Get really rich quantitative data and then also do some storytelling. Wonderful. One of the things we're also doing, um, because with 360 uh, states, communities across the country, you know, everybody's got like one really cool idea that they came up with, you know? I mean, you know, Salina, Kansas, put their data up on billboards, east and west on I-70, because, you know, the billboards were empty. I remember Rochester, uh, uh, New York area. Um, you know, when you go to the movie theater and they got the static slides, you know, you need to drink more Coke, You're, eat more popcorn. <laughs> By the way, where is that popcorn coming from? Uh, it's, so, a, it's a trick we have. Yeah, yeah. it's a great trick. Um, but you know, uh, arts are an industry in, you know, uh, in the county and all that type of thing. So um, it's the AEP6 playbook, and it's just something that'll be a growing document from past studies, on these studies as well, how to work to get you know, your arts organizations and your community engaged. We're gonna have a whole social media uh, work developed to sort of increase awareness in the community of the study itself. I'm not even talking about the results yet. Um, and then similarly, we're gonna say, you know, hey gang, you know, the study will be out in a year. Now is the time to give your Chamber of Commerce a call and say, it's time to do an arts breakfast, you know, and because you got to get on their calendar a year in advance. Let me tell you, in normal times, I talk to 20, 25 Chambers of Commerce a year. They are my best audiences. I will take a Chamber of Commerce to talk about the arts any day because Number one, they love the data, especially the economic data. It's just a myth buster for them, you know. But then um, it, it gives them permission, you know, if I could just say they, it, you know, it gives a lot of permission to then to like, okay, we can stipulate that, but now let's talk about how the arts improve the quality of our communities, you know, help us attract and retain a skilled, educated workforce, you know, arts in the schools, the research is clear, when a young person has the education, arts is part of their education, they're performing better academically, findings that cut across all socioeconomic strata, you know, when their arts are part of our health care, uh, we're healing better, we're healing faster, um, and uh, social cohesion, and some of you saw me actually hit this by mistake, but um, in addition to the economic impact study, there's going to be a whole new public opinion survey. And what do we need to get out of a pandemic? We got to jumpstart the economy, right? And the arts are kindling for the economy, right? It's getting us out of our homes, into the community, we're going back to local businesses. Local businesses, local merchants do very well, you know, as a result of these arts events. But it's also reconnecting us as a community. You know, we're going to, it's shared experiences in public spaces. You know, it's, um, hey, we're seeing Hamilton for the third time, hooray. Nobody cares who you voted for. Nobody cares where you practice your faith. It's this thing we do together. And in, um, what we've learned, and these numbers have been consistent over the years, 72% of the American population says the arts unify our communities regardless of age, race or ethnicity. 73%, the arts help us understand other cultures in our community. So, you know, it's really, there's, a, there's story, there's economics, there's uh, social cohesion, you know, and all of this is gonna be part of this study. And you know what, you can add 10 percentage points to each of those numbers for Arizona. We agree 10 percentage points more than our national counterparts. So. Uh, yeah, really wonderful environment here to do this kind of work. Love that. Fabulous. Uh, before we move to uh, question, and, uh, question and answers, I do want to acknowledge a few other people who are joining us. If you're an educator, would you please uh, raise your hand so we can acknowledge you? Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if you are tied to any of our community arts organizations, can you please raise your hand so we can acknowledge you as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so before we move to question and answers, anything else that's burning, like, I, oh, I wish I had said that, or? or I'd like to know yes. business leaders in the crowd. Could business leaders. Hands? Thank you. I just wanted to say one thing that went back to the last question that Randy brought up. Um, those communities that did the billboards, did the, 
the surveys uh, afterwards and did the shows afterwards about the information. It's what you do with it. Mm -hmm. um, I know that uh, when I was at Americans for the Arts, we would hear that some people would just put the nice PDF on their website, and that's not good enough. You have to make hay about it and get it into the hands of the people who the chambers of commerce is, the business community, but also empower the people who are helping with those surveys um, to be able to tell the story. We've had lots of organizations in Phoenix be able to bring their boards together, bring their patrons together, bring the community together, and use this information in a way that they're comfortable with. So it's what you do with it is what matters. Right. Great point. Wonderful, thank you. One other thing, um, in the West Valley, we were brought to, the, I was brought to the table of many different conversations for new businesses that were looking to come into the West Valley area. And they wanted to know more in depth about quality of life. What would there be for their people to do and engage with if they were to build their businesses in the area? In this arts economic impact study, we were able to delve into the information and give it to them specifically towards their cities to help them make a more informed decision about why should we consider Arizona? Why should we consider this particular area? Because it's not just always about the work, it is about the schools, but it's about the quality of life. What will our people do when they're not working? And having those conversations and being brought into those business meetings with the cities was very critical. So consider that as well, how this data can be used to impact not just the existing businesses and infrastructure, but those that are looking to come into our area as well. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, I, I, I told you this is an incredible panel, so please take advantage of their time, and uh, let's start with any questions that anyone may have. I see one back here. Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, I personally work with the Arizona Department of Education. Um, Dustin Loher is one of the people that is very much committed to this aspect and looking at it. They have actually received some additional funding. With this particular study that I addressed with him, he's able to sit back again and look at in individual areas. Where are they growing? Um, where are the dollars being spent for professional development, for additional classes? And please understand how that trickles down, right? So we're looking at the state saying that we've identified these schools and we've put money into Title IV funding to cover the gaps in these schools that don't offer specific types of classes. Now it trickles down even further because now these schools have the money and they're looking to other organizations to come and bring those classes or mobiles or whatever else directly to their schools because they've received that extra funding. From the nonprofit perspective, they're looking for me. So I have this money. You have the connections in the community. Your people have been vetted, and they're trained, and they're qualified. I don't have a music program. So can we use these Title IV dollars that, that Arizona has provided for you to bring this in? Yes, we can. And then we continue to use the data from a demographic perspective, because if your area is growing, now we have the data sustained to be able to say, we need additional money and additional funding to continue bringing these programs to the schools. It's not the best stopgap measure, but it is an opportunity to take this data and to be able to use it in conjunction. And I can tell you that the Arizona Department of Education is engaged and they are very much um, interested in using the data to be able to uh, provide additional um, classes and support where they can. I would just add that um, when you're in the business that we're in, you get good at translating to different interests in different sectors. So 
We use this data to speak to the healthcare industries. We use this data to speak to other business sectors, uh, also at the neighborhood level. But there is one place where everything starts, and that is in young life. And so um, if our strategy around arts education isn't deeply grounded and fundamental, you can't get the outcomes that we talk about in all those other sectors. So um, I guess my approach would be to make sure that children are in the center of every argument that we're making so that folks see the long sequential process that happens from young life into young adulthood and then for as long as the rest of us have days, um, that if it doesn't start there, you've missed something fundamental already and all of those other outcomes are dependent on it. So I had a couple things. Um, so in the arts, a lot of times, you know, when it's budget hearing night for the city or the state legislature or something, um, you get a lot of us up there, and there's so many talented kids already in the community. Make sure you, you play all the aces up your sleeve and have the young people be part of the testimony. Everyone gets three minutes, have the, you know, the kids, you know, the student poet laureate there, have, you know, a performance. And there's a way, actually, to use the arts to make it a hearing that people never forget. But also being very facile with the data. Right, so what uh, you know, policymakers, education leaders care about you know academic performance, you know grades, dropout rates, those type of things. There's a um, UCLA researcher, uh, James Catterall, who did longitudinal data for years on 25,000 students at a thousand different schools across the country. Big nationally representative sample, and what he did is he divided those students into four groups based on their level of arts involvement. So up here at the top, you know, practice violin three hours a day, and you know, here maybe got to the museum once a year or something, and then compared academic performance. The arts involved students, better grades, better standardized test scores, yep. lower dropout rates, better attitudes about community service, right, civic engagement. Now, because you're all savvy research people, you're probably thinking, well, yeah, Randy, but aren't these kids from better educated, maybe more affluent families? You'd expect them to do better because they can afford, you know, instrument and three hours of music lessons, all that type of thing. So Catterall anticipated that and he went back to his base of 25,000 students and looked at the lowest socioeconomic quartile. So kids who attend Title I schools, live in low-income communities, and ran the same analysis and found not only do the results hold, but there was an even greater disparity between the arts involved and the non-arts involved kids. Helping education researchers think, wow, maybe the arts help level the playing field or kids who got a late start catch up. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll give you some national data that underscores this. Put Catterall right there. Um, every 10 years or so, the Department of Education sort of gets a big thermometer, sticks it in the ground everywhere in the country, and like, what's, how much arts education's out there? And, you know, over the, nationally, you know, it's like, well, it is sort of held relatively steady, you know, up a little, down a little, that kind of thing. However, go back to those low-income communities, those Title I schools, huge drop-off. Mm -hmm. And to the point where the Secretary of Education at the time called this a civil rights issue. Mm -hmm. Because it was clear that by keeping these young students, these students um, from having an arts education, we were limiting their ability and their opportunity to benefit from school. Catterall's research actually, he eventually followed them into their 20s. And wow. even in their 20s, as young adults, there were measurable differences. You know, the arts education kids, more likely to have done some college, career-oriented jobs, you know, less, uh, you know, non-social behavior, those type of things. So it is, um, it's a huge issue. I think it's one of the most important things we can be focusing on now. And the good news is there's research there to really back that up. But we got to make sure everybody else is telling that story as well. We're all arts champions in here, but who's on our board of directors? Who are our neighbors? Um, they need to talk about the importance of arts education as well. Wonderful question. Thank you very much. Jose. Uh, I would, this whole uh, industry is based on individuals who practice their, their art, uh, art life. And I, I see a lot of data, but uh, how are you improving these individuals with families that they have to support? Most of the artists that I know, 
Yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great point. Um, you know, about so if everyone could hear or not, you know, uh, where in the data and where's the research that shows that this work is improving, the, you know, the lives of the individual artist? And can't have the arts without the artist. You know, we'll be clear about that. However, I will say, um, you know, it's always been a challenge. And then during the pandemic, it was just brutal, brutal for the arts, brutal for the artists. Uh, the Bureau of Economic Analysis just came out and said the arts uh, in this country, uh, artists, arts businesses, as bad as the airlines, uh, oil drilling, all that type of thing, the, among the most severely impacted during the pandemic. However, the economic impact data that we've been talking about, and we do you know, try and gather employment data and occupational data for the arts, made artists eligible for the um, pandemic unemployment uh, assistance. Change the conversation completely. And that, I mean, that, that type of thing hasn't happened before. Billions of dollars went to the venues, you know, and the venues hire the artists. And so yes, some of that's trickled down, but some of that is actually was direct pandemic um, uh, employment assistance uh, for the artists. And so that's one way, um, you know, money is a big part of it, so. Yeah, and we um, at the City of Phoenix know that this is the nonprofit sector, and we had to, when making the case for CARES Act and ARPA, had to work with organizations like Chico to get information on artists so that we could have that information. And one of the things that my staff um, wants to do with this study is how do we engage artists and artist collectives into this and not just yes. the nonprofit sector. We are a, a funder that doesn't just fund 501c3s, so how can we get more artists involved? And it's going to be a big undertaking, but we hear you because we had to go and find that information to make sure that dollars were available to individual artists. And because of having that data with the economic impact, um, we were given more money uh, and a new artist grant program in the city of Phoenix is coming out in a couple of weeks. <laughs> yes. um, and to do real artist projects, and it's not just about recovery anymore, it's what can we do to help you with your craft and to help the community. But we had to create secondary data to be able to support it. So one of the... Um I would just, uh, Jose, it's nice to see you. And what I would say is um, back to that concept of ecosystem and then add another E word, enterprise. And the reason that we're going to go after that deeply qualitative relationship based planning model is so that we can really bond the connections inside that ecosystem because. You know, any, of, any one of us who felt that entrepreneurial spirit, you immediately come to understand that it's your friends, it's your conversations, it's your relationships that are sourcing those opportunities. But if we're not on first name basis with each other, then those relationships don't have enough depth in yeah. order to, to source the opportunity. One of the pieces that'll be part of AEP 6 is actually does get beyond what Mitch was describing, beyond what's the nonprofit arts and culture sector. And um, we're doing county level reports using federal data uh, about all the arts. So how many arts business establishments, their employment, their income. So that's commercial, nonprofit, as well as occupational data. Um, because not every artist works for an arts organization, right? Sometimes you got a designer that works for a law firm and type of thing. And, you know, there's a lot of those um, people have been missed in a lot of research, but uh, the federal data has gotten better and accessibility to it. So we're going to be creating reports for all 3,143 counties in the United States that will have those data. Uh, again, it'll be something that's measurable, countable, you know, it's not going to be the silver bullet. It's like, but it's just another step in that right direction because um, you got to be counted, right? You know, you got to you got to demonstrate that we're here in existence, and, and so 
that's one thing we're able to do as part of this. Jose, what I'll say to you quickly, I am a performing artist still. So I know your pain and I equally hope that um, the things that we're looking to do with the study and then also with the additional collection of data will assist us because I was also deeply economically impacted as a performer and I thank God that I did have other employment and I know how many of my friends suffered, um, especially those that didn't have a spouse with a full time with benefits. Um, that is part of our lifestyle. I live it with you. I understand and feel your pain and uh, Hopeful, we are going to make some changes to be able to collect some more of that data going forward. Thank you. Uh, we have time for maybe two, but I'm going to go with one more question for now. We'll see how it goes. And I saw your hand in the back. Yes, and, and a lot of that information we do get um, frequently when we are doing grant applications. We do ask you, how are your expenses? And then the reporting comes in, where did you spend your money? So some of that data is there. To the higher extent of being able to call it on a higher level to what you're discussing is something that still remains a great opportunity. But we do get some of that data, but we've got, we've got a long way to go. So keep voicing it, <laughs> and we keep voicing it, Jose, as artists so that we can really have the data to see what the true economic impact is, especially as we go through difficult times. Okay. All right, we do have time for another question. Ah, there's so many. How do you pay? How about right here? I see a lot of people pointing to you, so. So the arts and economic prosperity is largely about, and I call it nonprofit, you know, arts and culture sector. Um, uh, but it actually that is um, might be a municipally owned, you know, facility. It might be um, where arts and culture are happening at a, a library or within another, you know, cultural organization. You know, there may be a church that's got a performing arts series, and so. I sort of say that because otherwise the title would be like three pages long of this study. But um, we will and we do look sort of very expansively that way. Um, arts and economic prosperity, though, uh, for the most part, does not include, you know, commercial art galleries, you know, uh, uh, the motion picture industry. And so, you know, there is, there is a box, you know, that's sort of uh, what's in and, and what's out, and uh, there's a lot of spec uh, specifics with that. But and that's typically, you know, why just nonprofits? Well, typically, when the public sector, you know, is investing in the arts, those dollars are going to nonprofit organizations, and it's an appropriate question to ask, you know, uh, for the public. What kind of benefits are we getting here? You know, obviously, quality of life benefits, you know, and cultural benefits. Um, but now, you know, we can talk about, uh, you know, economic benefits as well. So it sounds like there'll be a lot of overlap there, maybe not 100% overlap. Where are your organizations located? Okay, so one of these cities that are here today, um, they're gonna be collecting data and looking for people to assist them in getting some of the information. I would say um, keep the eye out. Uh, so when the surveys are requested to help find out who's doing what, where, when, and how, you be able to connect and help provide some of that information and then be able, when the information is finally called and put together, to be able to get some of that data back to be able to make it actionable for you. So if you're in Tempe, I know I saw some hands in Tempe. If you're in Chandler, this Michelle is going to get information out. Make sure you sign up Mesa. with these cities. And Mesa's here, Cindy's yeah. back there, hi Cindy. Rick, you know, so we're here. Yeah. Um, make sure you keep an eye out, sign up with the city's information so that when it's time and we're asking for that, you can submit your information and be a part of the process. And I also think it's going to be a city's prerogative. Phoenix, you know, is a large city with 520 square miles and I would love to include everyone. But what we don't wanna do is we don't wanna include like 
the Live Nations of the world that are gonna tip the scales of the yeah, other right. communities. But we do have some small independent bookstores, venues that should be nonprofit, but they don't wanna jump through those hoops and so we don't wanna be that barrier. So it's probably gonna be a conversation with us about who we can include um, that's mm -hmm. equitable and doesn't tip the scales um, and break the system. Wonderful. So Very your for-profit business at a minimum needs to have a DUNS number yes. and then there's a new coding system is yes. Yes. Yeah, so yes. if you're running a for-profit creative industries, it's really valuable to have that DUNS number mm -hmm. so that you show up in the creative industries data. Yeah, and the new federal data um, actually will capture, uh, you know, the commercial entities because they'll also have an X code. I know we're getting into the jargon city here, but... Uh, um, Could do it all day. Uh, the feds are yeah. getting a lot better at counting, yeah, and, and including as well. Yeah, and by the way, the Duns, as, as artists, every time they say sign up for this, we're like, oh man, what is that going to cost me now out of my it's very free. limited budget? The Duns number is free. It's free. Okay? Yeah. So just go in there and get it done. Duns and Brad Street, and you'll have it. D U N S, and, not like yes. Duns, we're Duns with it. Right, D U N S. <laughs> Dun and Brad Street. So um, artists, it's free. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we've come to that time where it is time to conclude this panel. I, uh, before we acknowledge our panelists, I want to invite you all uh, in the gallery. Uh, we have um, an exhibit, uh, Less Jurassic. Uh, we also have a, a reception for you. So if you have questions that you want to get answered, our panelists are going to be there to answer them. And it's just so nice to see everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And let's acknowledge our wonderful panel. And thank you. Uh, we'll see you in the gallery. All right. All right. I cannot wait to connect with you. That's going to be great. Yeah.